great. Thank you so much, Vidak. And thank you to Barrel Elites for having us here today. Certainly what should prove to be quite a timely topic when we discuss secular versus cyclical trends. There's a couple that come to mind looking at certainly what's happening in bond markets over the past couple of weeks, but we'll, we'll del delve into that a little bit deeper. Maybe first some introductions. So my name is Laura Cooper. I am a senior strategist over at BlackRock. I run a team of multi-asset investment researchers. And maybe Ira, hand it over to you. Uh, Ira Jersey, I am the chief interest rate strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence, which is the research arm of Bloomberg LP. I have uh, extensive experience on uh, the sell side with Credit Suisse and also with Oppenheimer Funds, uh, helping manage their uh, taxable fixed income portfolios. Hello. Um, my name is Ishim Tokat Achikal. Um, I'm with Principal. I head up a, a dynamic risk multi-asset strategy team where we manage uh, 25 billion uh, in multi-asset portfolios. Um, and secondly, I actually got recently an extended responsibility to build um, and enhance our global macro capabilities. Uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting area with a lot of moving parts as we'll talk today. So excited to be here. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Jones. I'm with Dodge Construction Network. I head up our Industry Insights Research Division. I've been in the construction industry my entire career, so I'm interested in talking with you all about that. Marina Severodovsky. I'm the head of sustainable investing for the Americas for Schroeder's, which is a roughly trillion dollar asset manager based in the UK. Um, and I look after kind of all components of sustainability. Um, we are a fully integrated shop, so all of our investments fully kind of integrate what is called ESG, you know, kind of um, considerations. But then we also run sustainable and even impact strategies as a subset of that. All right, great. So let's dig in a little bit deeper. So maybe to kick off, so for our Q4 outlook, BlackRock really s suggested that now investors should harness what we call mega forces. And so what we see is that there's going to be a series of significant shifts across economies, across sectors that are going to disrupt profitability and essentially will open up long run kind of opportunities but that's already being played out now. And I think really what comes to mind is the artificial intelligence exuberance that has really driven the US equity rally so far this year. Is this really just hype or are there actual fundamental secular demand drivers behind this? We can think about geopolitical fragmentation, what's happening in the world now, the subsequent rise in commodity prices. Is this cyclical? Is this secular? But perhaps the one that I want to kind of touch on first is the really the dominant kind of debate that I think most strategists and investors have had for the past couple of years. And that's really this question about inflation. Is inflation secular or is it cyclical? So we can think about last week, stocks and bonds had this exceptional rally. The Fed signaled that they're probably done their hiking cycle. The US 10-year yield you know, went from 5%. We've seen it you know, bid quite strongly. Is this, Ira, I want to turn to you first. You know, are we in this kind of secular new macro regime of elevated inflation where what we have seen is a repricing of rates to higher equilibrium? Or as we've seen in the past you know, week or so, this is just a cyclical trend, inflation will ease and we'll start to see more of those duration bids and we are maybe in this lower in, in yield environment once again. Well, I think when we talk about the uh, secular versus cyclical, I think secularly, the uh, the 40 plus year rally in, in the fixed income markets is over. So I, I think that's the first thing that we can say is that we have broken that trend. We're not going down to negative 2% or wherever the long term trend from 1984 to present is going to take you. So I, I think the question is, has that secular trend turned? And if it has turned, which I do think it has, are we, is it going to be upward or are we going to basically go sideways and just have more cyclicality uh, within a new kind of sideways trend? And I think that's probably where we're eventually headed, but nobody really knows that yet. So it's going to take some time to determine you know, where, uh, w what the cyclicality then is of inflation. I think the one thing that the market's currently getting wrong is with 10-year inflation break-evens at under 2.5%, I think there's an opportunity there because I do suspect that over um, you know, 
10 years or so that will subsequently print inflation somewhat higher than that. So we won't quite get down to the Fed's 2% target, um, but we'll get very close, uh, you know, if you, because remember, they're also using a different metric than CPI. They're using the PCE deflator. Um, but we'll never quite reach it. So, so the days of 1% inflation and disinflation, I think, are over for probably the next generation or so. So, Yesha, maybe turning to you. So, are you of the mind that we are in this higher inflation regime and we are going to see yields reprice at these elevated levels? I mean, we could see the 10 year with that 4.5 to 5.5 is the new norm. Or do you kind of have the, the, the opposite view, whereas now 5% yield is quite an attractive entry point? And what really are the portfolio implications if we are in this kind of regime change? Thank you. Um, well, I think uh, the market hearing also from, from the conference here has already come to grips with the reality Ira mentioned in the sense that the last 15 years of very low inflation, uh, very low interest rates is over. I think that's why we're seeing so much uncertainty uh, in the bond market, right? That's where the moment has been much more violent compared to its normal volatility. Because everyone's trying to figure out where that you know, secular mean is, if you will. And um, so we, we in, our, in, our, you know, uh, in our discussions with my PM team as well as our economists are also of the mind that you know, inflation is going to be normalized and higher than what we've seen in the last 30, 40 years um, since the uh, you know, 80s, right? Um, that said, um, there are interesting secular forces at play, hopefully we'll get into, that move in opposite directions. So we are gonna continuously monitor this, but our expectation is probably um, inflation around two and a half percent for the next, next decade is, is, you know, is a fair value in a sense that the Fed is targeting officially 2%. But I don't think they're going to hardly target that, like very strictly. So they're going to allow a bit of a drift. Um, so, so that's our kind of inf you know inflation expectation. And the rates again will are very much related to obviously inflation, and we expect uh, rates to be higher. And we have all these fancy models. I have quant background <laughs> as well. I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to go to the basics, right? So, what's the cost of capital in the economy? Well, if you think about the U.S. economy, right, so if the U.S. potential growth is 2%, real GDP growth, right, and then if inflation is around 2 2.5%, what's the cost of capital? At the moment, 4.5%, right? So I think so something like 4%, 4.5% long-term 10-year interest rate is something the U.S. economy can't handle. I think we can debate whether, you know, within this, then, you know, what are the drivers? Is that 2% really uh, the potential growth? But um, I, so our view has been that, yeah, um, there are cyclical forces at play, but we think we're landing at a secular trend here. Um, and our portfolio is positioned to have some real assets in it, right? So I do have a strategic allocation to real assets in my portfolios. And, and I do vary that based on the business cycle, the, depending on the inflation cycle. And, and we think that that's smart, that you know, a lot of investors should have some real assets, things like infrastructure, <laughs> right? Not resources and, and commodities. So you want those drivers in your portfolio. Although in the long term, equities are a real asset, <laughs> unlike nominal bonds. But that short term shock can really hit you if you don't have inflation protection in your portfolio. So the key theme that I'm getting from both of you is that, okay, we are in this environment where investors have to get readjusted to these higher yielding types of, of, of backdrop. So Steve, I want to bring you into this conversation because you cover the construction sector extensively. So arguably, if we are in a higher rates regime, that will have significant implications for the U.S. housing market, for real estate more broadly. You have excellent high frequency data, I know at Dodge. How are you kind of seeing this cyclical versus secular trend play out, particularly in U.S. construction activity? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I do appreciate your focus on real tangible assets because that's what we create. <laughs> um, the construction industry has reached a trillion dollars last year here in the U.S. And it 
we're looking at it continuing at that level and going beyond. But much like we heard from the folks on the healthcare panel, it is made up of thousands of micro markets, both geographically, it's a very local business, um, and also by project types, of which we track probably 30 different ones. And we track at Dodge, we track every project north of a million dollars in North America. As soon as we can learn about it, when it's probably been awarded to an architect all the way through um, its completion. And so we're, we have been doing this for decades. So we have lots of, of data and you can roll all that up and say, yeah, construction this year starts will be down 5%, next year they'll be down 6%. But every single line item is its own unique story mm -hmm. in this business. Um, obviously, higher rates and tighter lending Right, I've still got my Silicon Valley Bank uh, credit card here in my wallet <laughs> as, as a keepsake. <laughs> right. um, uh, clearly that has impacted the commercial markets, the privately driven markets, the investor uh, driven markets. You look at what's happened in residential. Um, but at the end of the day, we're not a product business, right? We're a service business in that way. We only serve what it is that people actually need, what governments actually need, Right? We create these assets that are needed. Um, and so things like that kind of rent to buy consideration that you make in any residential decision, right? that's where it all boils down to at the end of the day. So, so many other factors come into play because the human being is actually ends up being a major factor in the construction industry. Um, most of the you know, residential, hotel, office, retail, they're all gonna be weaker, right? Um, the public markets, though, have probably, in terms of that construction starts numbers, offset that one for one. Because so much uh, federal money has come into so many of those kinds of markets. We consider, at this point, manufacturing to be kind of a quasi-public market now, because of all the government money that came in. Uh, when we tracked, say, the last 15 or 20 years and the amount of manufacturing spend there was, last year, 300% increase. Right? Um, it'll soften a little bit in the next couple of years, but still, that money is very real. And the onshoring, right, which is, I think, a positive trend for us in terms of manufacturing. Um, and then the interesting things that you begin to see happen around you know, the big battery plants right, in Georgia, things like that. Now they're starting to do huge housing developments around those. Right? All these parts and pieces, they work on different streams and they influence each other in, in interesting ways. Um, I, I think, ultimately, the, um, the structural aspects of it are impacted by things like the demographics. As I say, we build for people. There are just going to be fewer people in the United States, right? So that demand will change over time. Um, we're seeing a really interesting trend. Um, we are all aware of the hollowing out of cities, but we're seeing an actual increase in rural, not suburban, but rural projects uh, going on. And you hear a lot about the doom loop in cities. I don't think New York experiences it to the same degree because we have so much integrated residential. But the places like the Minneapolis's and the St. Louis's who lost that and never replaced it um, are really suffering that. And so now what happens to office space? But within office space, there's data centers which are going through the absolute roof. And some of those are in those more rural locations. So, um, and what will remote officing due to the idea of what the office building is. The office building has been as much as a third of the entire commercial market, right? That's, that, as a core office product, is definitely going to cycle. But again, not necessarily due to the typical cycles as much as all the other things going on in the economy that tend to drive that. Um, and then lastly, the construction industry, much like other industries, faces a very severe labor shortage right now. Um, we finished a survey last year of trade contractors. And God bless all the general contractors, but they don't build a dang thing. It's the trade contractors who are at the work face building it. We asked the question among the five biggest trades, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, steel, and concrete, how many of your existing staff do you think are likely to retire in the next five years? And what's fun about doing research like this is you never know what the answer is gonna be. I thought maybe it'd be eight, maybe 10, maybe 12 if it was really dangerous. 32% of the entire construction industry are going to be retiring in the next five years. And it's worse for the bigger companies who have the nice 401k plans and things of that nature, right? People are taking advantage of those things. And we don't have enough people coming in. So when we ask people, okay, what are you doing about that? Two things, 
neither of which are very good. One of which is we're raising our prices, which is an inflationary push, of course. The other is we're just turning down work, which means, and we're seeing that projects are taking longer to start and longer to start and longer to start. That's just going to exacerbate that situation. So again, construction, you can talk about it as a whole, but oh, there's thousands of, of stories in the naked city, which makes it a fascinating industry. And I think what's so interesting is you touched on really two crucial mega forces or these kind of secular trends. Mm. One is around geopolitical fragmentation and the positive externalities in terms of reshoring, but as well the demographics. And I definitely want to dig into both of those deeper, but maybe Marina, to bring you into this conversation, I mean, the theme really so far has been around inflation. We're talking about labor shortages having significant knock-on effects to keeping wage pressure elevated. From your seat at Schroeder's as head of sustainability, there's a confluence of factors, but the transition to a low carbon economy is often deemed to be inflationary. How are you seeing investors positioned for this type of environment from a sustainable lens? Yeah, thank you. Actually, I got the demographics and the deglobalization bit too, but uh, certainly decarbonization as a trend, those are all long-term trends in our view. All of those things are really inflationary and they make up actually the 3D framework that we're, sounds like similar to BlackRock's, we call it the 3D reset, which is a decarbonization, deglobalization, demographic shift. So we've moved, we believe, from kind of the nice era, like it was nice while it lasted, it's the non-inflationary, consistently expansionary 40 years. Um, no more of that, uh, it's much harder going forward. And I would say, the kind of implications of decarbonization, ultimately it's the cost of innovation, it's sort of scaling up you know, uh, clean energy technologies, there's the issue of minerals and rare metal scarcity, um, and there's the kind of role of government to drive inflation, um, you know, government policies basically around decarbonization doing that. So um, again, to kind of tick through them, there's the cost of experimenting and exploration that encourages technological innovation. Um, there's the issue of higher carbon pricing, we talk about fossil inflation, people like to make up words. Um, you know, very hard to escape that at the front end of the energy transition. You have kind of stricter, you know, carbon pricing impacts on both energy prices and electricity prices. Um, then again, we said these technologies are dependent on mineral and rare earth uh, metals. Um, and there's only so much of that to go around. And so you have the issue of scarcity and companies kind of competing for access. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those metals are located in China. So that goes to that question of decoupling and so those supply chains that's kind of a fraught issue. And then, you know, the supply of renewables, you know, kind of um, the U.S. is really focused on increasing the supply of renewables rather through fiscal spending. Um, so, and then putting a price on pollution, again, you're kind of seeing that in sort of different parts of the world. And so it really is intertwined, I think, with, with that sort of um, you know, inflationary pressure. Um, and then again, it's exacerbated by the, the issue of sort of reshoring supply chains, the cost of that and then the issue of demographics and the kind of supply you know, of, of labor and the wages. And so all of those things are very kind of run through with sustainability about how companies are going to respond to those things. But it aggregated at all points to, I think, an extended inflationary environment. So, Yeshim, I want to bring you back into the conversation because I think it was you who said that, you know, you could have counter like offsetting forces, right? Demographics could be seen potentially as disinflationary, whereas we have others, as Marina mentioned, given the supply shortages and some of the crucial inputs into the transition to net zero, those are inflationary. How, at principle, do you kind of decipher between what the net impact of that could be and how do you position portfolios accordingly, looking at the cyclical versus secular? Yeah, well, I it's, it's a complex issue, right, uh, <laughs> that um, especially these secular trends are um, sometimes slow moving. I've been in the industry for 20 years. We've been talking about aging populations, unsustainable amounts of debt, and is social security even sustainable? And all, a lot of these things have been at play and have been slow moving. So, so I think, uh, from a more a PM perspective, how do you decouple what's secular and what's cyclical is important? But let me focus on the secular aspects first. Um, if you think about the drivers, and I think we have a very able panel to talk about the drivers and the three Ds, I want to talk about a P that we haven't touched on yet, which is productivity, right? So if you think about demographics, um, you know, a lot of people agree that uh, that's potentially um, inflationary as we have labor shortages in, in labor supply, right? Um, 
you know, the other, you know, obviously deglobalization. We've been eating the fruits of, you know, globalization, lower uh, production costs and offshoring and, and the peace dividend, some people call, right? So we had an extended period of um, relatively without world wars and, you know, and, and pretty reasonably stable geopolitical environment, which hopefully remains. That's all our base case. Uh, but obviously tensions are brewing in multiple locations in, in terms of geopolitical tensions and, and therefore people want to uh, you know, bring to safer shores and have, have more control over their supply chains and so forth. So that's clearly you know, another inflationary force. Um, and, uh, you know, and debt, right? So amounts are increasing. So that's kind of inflationary. So to me, the biggest, to us, the biggest wild card is productivity and the... Um, what, what does technology bring? In the earlier sessions, we talked about AI, uh, right? And there is a, a time lag between when you kind of have this new innovator techniques and when it actually gets into the real economy, right? So there are lags on that. But it does feel real that we are seeing, you know, productivity gains or the innings, early innings of productivity gains um, uh, due to technological innovation. So there's so much, I mean, we're in asset management, right? So there are so many inefficiencies in our operational infrastructure. What, what needs to be done manually, for God's sake, at this day and age? My boys, I have teenagers, are like, you guys are dinosaurs. Like, this is all, like, you should be able to do it on your phone and stuff like that, right? So there's a ton of, like, actually uh, inefficiencies that can be really, um, you know, um, cleaned up. And, and, and even in the coding space, I, then I, meant I have a quant background as well, and I have a quant team, and we can use some of these new techniques and reduce our programming time by 20, 25%, and we're starting to do that, right? So think about all these things. So to me, the biggest wild card, and for economists, um, uh, being an economist by training, the most difficult thing to actually model is the impact of technology on productivity. It's a very hard thing to crack. And to me, that is the hope we all have, whether regarding climate change or aging populations. If we can be much more efficient, if we can increase our productivity, to us, that's something to watch very closely in terms of secular trends that can be very deflationary. Think about the last time you bought a, you know, a TV, TV, right? So five years later, the cost is a half or a quarter of what it used to be. So there, Technology can be very deflationary. It can really have positive productivity impacts. So we're excited about that um, and its implications on a secular basis um, and something we're watching very closely. I'll get to maybe cyclical stuff later since I spoke about <laughs> I just want to I just want to have a quick quick follow-on question to that I mean if we look at earnings from like really the large AI players they surpassed for the most part already elevated expectations do you think that that tech leadership can persist or are you looking for more areas that are miss maybe not yet fully reflective of the AI trend so medical innovation healthcare devices legal sector like are you looking for pockets or tech leadership as a way to play that AI trend now yeah, but I, so basically we've been overweight technology. It's been a good thing this year and, uh, and the larger names um, because we thought there are both, you know, cyclical, <clears throat> I mean, secular tailwinds as well as cyclically, right? These firms are very um, well capitalized. They, you know, they are very good, you know, kind of a higher quality and so forth. So, so we, we thought, we think that, you know, although the price is, very expensive and it's very uncomfortable. It was mentioned in the <laughs> earlier session around technology and what the PEs are. But again, I've been long enough in the industry that valuations can be extended for a long time before they mean revert. And unfortunately, valuation payoff comes in chunks and can be negative payoff for a couple of years before it mean reverts. So we still think there is more room to run although we're not as excited as we were, obviously, after the rally. Um, so there are definitely pockets, our underlying managers, I don't allocate to individual stocks, uh, but our managers are looking for things that are obviously not as expensive and have still pockets of, of value in, 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 in within the secular trend. And I think there was a really interesting chart that kind of was making the rounds throughout this year, and that was the decoupling of 
rates versus like tech stocks. We've seen you know rates continue to march higher, but yet tech stocks rose, rose as well alongside. So Ira, I want to kind of bring you into this. We briefly mentioned geopolitical fragmentation, and I think an interesting trend that has struck me is that we have seen China continue to offload their U.S. Treasury holdings at the same time where really the fiscal challenges of the U.S. are coming back on the radar of investors, which ultimately could lead to this higher rates environment carrying over through, through the next uh, coming years. Are you of this view as well that this is the secular, the start of a secular trend playing out? Or how do you decipher between kind of these cyclical and secular trends within this? Well, so those are two different questions. So yes. one's on the demand side, one's on the supply side effectively, right? So let's talk about the demand side quickly. This idea that the China and other central banks are going to be offloading their treasury holdings, that's true to some degree, although not to the extent that I think that the, the headline will, uh, all the headlines suggest, number one. Number two is even though central banks and some sovereign wealth funds are divesting a little bit from treasuries, in particular they were doing this when uh, they were trying to defend their own currencies uh, when the dollar was strengthening so much, they were selling uh, dollars and buying their home currency, so, so it was actually reserve management management was the reason they were doing it. Um, and also, China and most central banks don't own a lot of a lot of market risk. They own short-term treasuries. They own two-year treasuries, one-year treasuries, T-bills. They don't own a lot of market risk. Who's buying? There's still a ton of investors from overseas, foreign private investors, are still net buyers of treasuries. It's a lot lower this year than it was a year ago or in 2021, but they're still net buyers. And those investors tend to buy longer duration, longer, uh, more, much more market risk than central banks do. So on the, on the demand side, from, from, the for, from the foreign perspective, it's more of a push than it really is divestiture. On a notional basis, foreigners haven't been buyers of long-term treasuries treasury debt for seven years. So what? It's all been domestic. Now, part of that's because the Fed's bought everything in sight, right? So we, I admit that. Um, and that's obviously changed a little bit. But when we talk about the supply side, where so our forecast is for two trillion dollar deficits basically for the next three years, um, which is you know eyes pop out and everyone says, oh my God, who's going to buy all this stuff? Um, well. Part of the reason that there's going to be all of this, uh, this deficit is because of some of the things you mentioned. We mentioned before about Social Security. Uh, when you go back 20 years, the majority of the population wasn't retired. That's shifting now, today, in the last couple of years. You had Social Security, Medicare, and interest on the public debt 25 years ago was under a quarter of all federal spending. Today, it's almost half. So in the last 20 years, it's doubled. And the, so, so the reason that we have to issue all of this debt is basically to pay for the baby boomers for retiring and for their health care. Um, that, that's, that's a large portion of the reason why we have to issue this debt. And the second is, quite frankly, I, I'm not going to call it fiscal mismanagement, but it's a choice that Congress has made to continue to spend a lot of money and not raise taxes. Um, so, you know, we, we always talk about, you know, the Republicans seem to be fiscally responsible, but only when it's politically prudent for them, because in 2017, the Republicans voted for massive tax cuts that increased the deficit massively, and then the Democrats added on to that by, by uh, deficit spending even more with other fiscal plans, including things like the Inflation Reduction Act, which, by the way, probably in the near term is actually helping keep inflation a little bit higher because they're spending a lot of money. Longer term, I think you can argue that it probably will help. Uh, things like infrastructure spending tend to be deflationary, but only in the long term. So, uh, so I do think that there's these two trends, right, demand and supply trends that are both probably at the margin going to keep things higher. So the framework and the way that we're thinking about deficits and how they'll affect markets is the treasury market will continue to be pro-cyclical with the economy. So when the economy's weaker, inflation trends a little bit lower, treasuries will rally, but maybe they won't rally as much as they would if the debt burden was much lower. And then conversely, sell-offs when uh, inflation moves up and, and the growth is higher uh, will wind up being worse, right? So, so instead of being at 2% uh, treasuries, maybe we're at two and a quarter. Instead of being at 5% treasuries, maybe we're at five and a half, right? That's uh, in, in a good time. So, so when we think about the, the debt burden, it just, it just kind of moves up. If you were to do a model, it basically moves up your intercept 
by you know, some margin. And we don't know what that margin is yet. Over time, we'll be able to use some of our own AI and ML models and stuff like that to try to determine it. Um, but that's, that's how we're thinking about that framework right now. And I know you're kind of producing your Q4 outlooks right now. Excellent research available on the Bloomberg Terminal. What could I maybe quickly ask you what your 10-year target, 10-year U.S. Treasury target yield is a year from now? Yeah, so our end of 2024 target is uh, is a little over 3%. So we're still looking for about 125 basis point rally. Now that's predicated on our economics team's outlook that we're going to have a recession in 2024. Um, so assuming we have a recession, then yields are going to be lower. That's not, um, I, I think, really saying a whole lot. You're talking about 100 base, 125, 130 base point rally from where we are today. I mean, we just sold off 70 basis points in like two months. Is the, the, if we rally 150 basis points in a year, that would not be a shock. So uh, you mentioned recession. So Steve, I want to kind of bring you into this because typically construction is seen as a leading indicator for you know where we are in the U.S. economic cycle. But we've all, you've also brought up kind of the demographics, the structural shortages that are occurring in the key sector. When we were we were chatting before this panel, you mentioned you know it's not so much about cyclical versus secular; it's about evolution. And I'm yeah. curious. That, that struck struck me. I'm like curious if you can kind of explain more around that particular idea. Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Um, because of the nature of the industry, because of the highly fragmented nature of the industry and the micro market aspect of it, and the fact that everything that gets built gets built for the use by people, um, the kinds of things that end up driving it um, are difficult to say whether they're cyclical, uh, cyclical or secular, um, because they're often a result of simply the evolution, the idea of what an office is. I mean, think about Mad Men, right? The big deal was that the corner office with the glass. And, you know, and I, you know, I did a lot of office uh, design when I was in architecture for 20 years. And that went to cube farms, and then that went to hoteling and collaborative spaces. And now, I don't know where it's going to go to in terms of remote and hybrid models, but it continues to evolve. Look at what has happened to retail. Uh, we all have big malls. Everybody went to the big mall. Well, the big malls, I think there's a, a half as many malls as there were, right? And there was a resurgence of smaller um, downtown retail. Um, I live in the Upper East Side here, and every open space is now a cannabis shop, okay? <laughs> Talk about a budding industry. Sorry. Um, but you look at any one of these, look at Warehouse. Warehouse was a dumb metal box that just kept rain off of dumb cardboard boxes. That's all it ever was. Today, not only did e-commerce drive that market through the roof and COVID drive it even further through the roof, those things, are, there'll be thousands of employees. They're as, as sophisticated as airports. They're incredible facilities now, right? They have evolved due to all kinds of other factors that end up being what are people buying, what are people need, what are people doing, right? It all really comes down to how the population is, is behaving. Parking structures, another just incredibly dumb thing for years, now, right, they've got sensors in them, so you'll know which parking garage I want to go to because that one's actually got six spaces available to me, and here's the price for me. I can figure all that out online, and it's got electric charging stations. All these things evolve so much that that's part of what's really driving the construction industry is, um, and you mentioned productivity, we're an embarrassment. Um, when you look at the productivity numbers, have basically bumped along flat compared to anything else, including agriculture, <laughs> have all gotten better. We've bumped along. But the growing focus on modular, prefabrication, and generally industrialized processes that are driven by technology, finally beginning to make a lift in productivity. Right? And so I think that you're going to see things like that begin to lower the cost of getting any kind of thing built. The, the idea of the digital twin is now also going to reduce the um, uh, operating cost, which is going to really help inflation. Right now, every single building is operated essentially on a rule of thumb. Oh, you just replace the filters every six months. Yep, <laughs> saying, Eddie, you didn't do that. No. Let's have the filter tell us when it actually needs to be replaced. Thank you very much. The people who are doing that now, there's a, a big one uh, with the entire uh, brand new airport in Dubai, is a complete um, digital twin now. Every moving part in that is reporting back to a central computer and this is when it actually needs to be touched by human beings. They have cut two thirds of the typical cost of operating, right? So there are important things that are happening as a result of the evolution of these building types, 
right, which can have, hopefully, an impact on the first cost and on the operating cost, right, and help everybody um, in terms of, uh, of the economic impact. So Marina, I, I kind of want to bring you back in to kind of tie it all together in a sense, because you mentioned at Schroeder's you have a 3D framework. So deglobalization, decarbonization, and demographics. Would you mind kind of maybe explaining a little bit more that framework and how you're using that to make investment decisions? Yeah, so we talked about it in the context of inflation, right, that those 3Ds are kind of inflationary by nature. But overall, I think it's just the way we kind of frame and understand like what investments really should look like in the coming decades. It's kind of the opposite of what we did before because it is a lot of things in reverse. Um, so as I said, kind of the decarbonization piece is this long-term trend towards setting net zero targets and delivering them both at the sovereign and the corporate level. Um, the deglobalization or, or you know, kind of um, undoing again, kind of decades of, of globalization is about reshoring supply chains and, and the decoupling of the East and the West. And then um, the, the demographics is certainly, we, we're going to have by 2030, I think, 85 million jobs unfilled, um, population growth moving in reverse by 28 or 29. I mean, it, and, you know, post-pandemic, I think people's perception of work, how they want to work, whether they want to work is very different. And so there's that piece of it. Um, and then just, you know, obviously in kind of the developed world, shrinking populations. So we use all of that, our investors use all of that to kind of frame out. It's really about both kind of um, avoiding risk and also capturing opportunity. And by the way, all of this is done with also active ownership and engagement with companies. So it's not sort of in a vacuum. We are active owners. 100% of what we do is active management. Um, and so we are working with companies to try to deliver solutions to some of these issues. But certainly we're doing climate risk assessment in every portfolio on every investment we take. We're looking at physical risk. We're looking at stranded asset risk because you do have assets that in approximate sense are going to be stranded before the end of their useful lives, some of which are currently being invested in, which is a problem. Um, we have also kind of companies as climate laggards, um, and this is in terms of setting decarbonization or a transition agendas and actually delivering on them. And so it's things like cost. Um, are they going to bear a much higher carbon price in the future? It's things like risk of litigation, regulation, legislation, um, and, and you know, policy. And it's also things like network effects. If you're in a supply chain of a large company that makes a commitment and has to deliver that commitment and you're not playing ball, you're not going to be in that supply chain much longer. And so there's a bit of a kind of a peer pressure element to it. And then, um, I mean, I'd rather talk about the opportunity than the risk, right? There's the climate leaders, there's the transition enablers, there's obviously innovation and scaling up these new technologies around um, uh, energy. As I said, minerals and rare earths, we do look at commodities as potentially a valuable hedge in this environment. Then on the deglobalization piece, there's both the companies and the countries that benefit from the reorienting of supply chains. So on one hand, you have kind of emerging markets that can attract manufacturing away from China, so India in the pole position, but also Vietnam, South Korea, and others. And then in terms of developed markets, um, the US is on the list, but also kind of Germany and other places in terms of smart manufacturing, and obviously technologies like AI, um, robotics. Um, and then probably my favorite piece, which is on the demographics, um, we've done some really key work this year on human capital ROI. You don't just have to flail around. I mean, you actually can measure um, sort of the benefits, right, of what you spend on your people being your greatest asset, frankly, for most companies, which have a lot of intangible value. And so we're looking at those companies who has the best sort of human capital management practices and return on investment on that, that uh, effort. And so those are the companies that are going to have lower productivity, excuse me, higher productivity, lower turnover, right? All the things that we're kind of looking for there. And as you said, productivity boosting technology as well. Um, and also on the demographics, I think it was mentioned, you know, briefly, but kind of healthcare. There's a huge kind of components there as well in terms of how you take care of an aging population. So it just gives, I think, investors a lot um, to kind of choose from. And these really are kind of enduring things because it's very hard next to impossible, I would say, to turn some of these things around, certainly something like demographics. And actually, I think, you know, the, the decarbonization isn't, isn't in reverse either. Um, so, so we just have to learn how to live with it. I mean, there's certainly numerous uh, secular trends to kind of parse through, and we could certainly be up here all day, but we only have a few minutes remaining. So maybe a quick fire last question. Is there a particular cyclical or secular force or trend that you think is not accurately being priced in by markets now? And how, or where is the greatest investment opportunity looking at it from that landscape? 
if anyone else has an idea, please <laughs> go first. <laughs> um, you know, maybe something that's not being completely priced is the the, the risk of uh, geopolitics right now. So, you know, we, we know that things like what's going on in, in Gaza and, and Israel and that conflict, um, th there's other budding conflicts that I think are underappreciated in the United States as well, where the, 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 the fact that we don't have the stability, the relative stability of having multiple superpowers kind of, you know, keeping things in check is is starting to spread much more rapidly now. And I think part of that, this is um, disaffection among certain groups globally um, in terms of um, in terms of their own you know, lagging behind other other secular uh, trends and 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 the West in in particular. Um, so I am a little bit concerned about you know the risk that will stem from that. Now, you know, what asset class is being is being mispriced? Well, that's a little bit difficult to say because it's so uncertain. But I think that that's one thing that we have to be very mindful of is the potential spread of pol political instability. I'm going to say AI. Uh, I've been reading up as well, trying to understand, right, what these new um, tools, you know, human beings are a dangerous thing, <laughs> you know, I've, I've had many, you know, like starting quants that take these various, like very powerful statistical tools and you're like, what did you do with that tool again, <laughs> you know? Again, like there's so much availability of well, so powerful tools that can be just used and unfortunately, you know, ill ways, not, you know, or taken the wrong way. And I think, how do we regulate? Because, again, there are going to be social disruptions, you know, jobs that will be going out, you know, of fashion and not needed anymore. Um, you know, who are the winners going to be? How do you regulate it across countries? You know, to me, AI is a big um, force um, that's upon us. And how do you deal with that is going to be very interesting to watch. It's funny. Um, there's a meme that went around in my industry uh, recently. Um, after the steel was up on a building, the steel workers union hung a great big banner that said, hey, chat GPT, finish this building. <laughs> um, not going to work. Not, gonna, not, not so well. I, I'm going to pick up on what I heard someone else say um, on another panel that's under-recognized in terms of asset value for existing real estate is climate change and um, just just what's going to, all the risk around all the coastlines as well as all, all the rivers and all of the highly saturated groundwater areas that we have in this country. And what about all the existing assets and that are all being held by, many being held by pension funds, and I'm worried about pension funds because they were always the go-to for every office building job I ever worked on. Yeah, we're going to fill it up and sell it to a pension fund. Those pension funds are sitting on all kinds of assets which are at risk for all kinds of other things. And I don't know that enough people are looking at that and thinking about what the ripple effect of that could be. Physical risk. Um, you would expect me to say this, given my title, but nature. Uh, we are really, really mispricing the value of nature. Um, there's a, a statistic that goes around that $44 trillion of so half of global GDP is directly dependent on ecosystem services, so things like water, freshwater pollination. But actually, it's 100%, like literally everything, because if you can't breathe, you, you can't work. Um, and so the fact that we've had, um, again, really like very little value attached to nature to date, um, and again, it's related to why we are trying to decarbonize, this is part of the solution, but there's technological solutions to that, carbon capture and sequestration, but nature is actually 10 times more effective itself if you were to kind of um, sequester uh, carbon in oceans or, or sort of, you know, land, forestry, et cetera. So um, very little institutional money. I think 0.3% of institutional assets are going into sort of nature investing. Um, and that's been a big initiative for us. Again, not in and of itself separate from decarbonization and climate, but really as one of the kind of lanes through which you have to run to get to that end point. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I, something that certainly doesn't come up often enough in investment discussions. But I think that's a great point to end on. If you can't breathe, you can't work. So it's a good perspective for life. So uh, with that, I'll thanks everybody. And yes, thank you to the panelists.